Hello, I'm Miss Arrowsmith and I'll be reading the next extract from Maladapted by Richard Curti. Right, are you sitting comfortably? Then we shall begin. In the first extract we met Cillian who was on the metro train with his father Paul. There had been a bomb explosion planted by the resistance group called the Revelation. We also met Tess who had planted the bomb. We left Cillian trying to find his father in the wreckage. Okay, let's find out what happens next. Chapter 4. Tess checked the time again, then as if in answer to her prayers, the wail of a police siren rose up from the streets. This was it. The blow had landed. A second siren that started, then a third. Tess stopped running and peered over the edge of the skyway. She saw the traffic signals far below snap to red, then one of the road pulsed blue, instructing everyone to clear. Moments later, emergency vehicles sped through, converging on the floating park district. Tess felt a swell of pride. One well-placed device would gridlock the entire metro system, and revelation would be headline news again forcing people to listen because that was the only way to make them understand. But just as she turned to turn to run on, a rhythmic thumping in the sky made her look up. Helicopters. Not just one, but four. Five emergency choppers swarming over the river like insects. And not just the police, but medical SWAT teams carrying biospares. Unease suddenly gnawed at Tessa's guts. Why would they send those to trains stuck in tunnels? She pulled off her running gloves with her teeth, fumbled for the smart cell in her pocket and froze. Horrific images were feeding onto the ultranet, smil smoke billowing from ventilation shafts, live cams from rescue workers wading through debris, bodies being carried from a metro station. No! Tess swiped a screen. This isn't it! She flittered across the news feeds, but with each touch the news got worse. Hundreds caught in metro crash. Many feared dead. Fire engulfs commuter trains. Tess felt her knees give way and she crumpled onto the freezing running track. It can't be. But all the news sites said otherwise, bombarding her with images of carnage and chaos. Somehow the plan had gone wrong, irretrievably wrong. Overwhelmed with nausea, she retched, painful choking spasms making her gasp for breath. Do you need any medical assistance? Tess looked up and saw a maintenance bot peering down at her with dispassionate LED eyes. You seem to be in distress. The voice was civil, devoid of emotion. Should I call for medical assistance? No, no. With immense effort, Tess hauled herself to her feet. Please stay where you are. No! The bot fell silent, as if sulking at the rebuke. It's... I'm all right, said Tess. Hold it together, hold it together. It's just cramp, really. Cramp can be a serious condition, the ever-helpful bot went on. Please stay where you are so I can call for assistance. I'm okay. It's nothing. Tess turned and forced herself to run on. Hold it together. She raised a hand to wave her thanks to the bot, but didn't dare turn around in case its infrared eyes saw the tears streaming down her face. Chapter 5 I've got you. I've got you. Cillian tried to hide his fear, but it felt like he was walking through hell, an acrid, burning hell. He cradled his father tightly in his arms as he stumbled through the choking heat and smoke-filled debris, forcing himself to block out all the death and carnage that filled the tunnel, to ignore the bodies and groans for help. If he was going to save his father, he had to stay focused on the faint dot of light in the distance. You're going to be okay, Cillian whispered over and over 
as he picked his way between the rails, hoping that somehow his words would keep Paul clinging to life. But he could feel his father's breathing getting shallower. Keep walking, one step at a time, away from death, towards the light. The news crew saw him first, their dramatic images of black smoke billowing from the train station entrance were being played in real time on the ultranet where millions watched in horror as their city came under attack again. Momentarily the acrid smoke swirled aside to reveal a figure emerging from the darkness. Over there! For a few seconds everyone just stared as the young man emerged into daylight, a bleeding victim draped in his arms, an image of hope and destruction, a miracle survivor. The paramedic's urgent whistle broke the spell. Resuscitation team, triage, station entrance. As the smoke cleared, Cillian was overwhelmed. Rescue workers rushed towards him in a blare of movement. His father was plucked from his arms and put on a stretcher, medics bombarding his body with tubes and wires, oxygen, adrenaline, analgesics. Cillian tried to follow, but other paramedics held him back. Relax! They lifted Cillian onto another stretcher. We've got you. Everything was confusion. He was blinded by a wizard of flashing lights from the emergency vehicles and news crews. People were rushing everywhere, cutting equipment was going into the tunnel and body bags were coming the other way. Cillian saw his father vanish into the mobile ER unit and knew he had to be there with him. He swung his legs off the gurney. Don't move, please. I'm okay. You're in shock. He tore off the tubes they were trying to fix to him and ran towards ER. Wait! But Cillian wasn't stopping for anyone. He barged through the doors to the operating theatre. Doctors huddled around Paul's body, issuing a stream of instructions in clipped tones. Nurses were plugging his father into a bewildering array of monitors and life support systems amid a cacophony of chirrups and beeps. A porter silently mopped up blood that was spilling onto the floor. As he edged closer, Cillian saw his father's hand, the calm, familiar hand that he'd known all his life, that he'd clutched as a young child, now sticky with blood, jangling and twitching as the nerves jangled. He looked up at the monitor scrolling with Paul's vital signs. I see it. Instantly the pattern of frightening irregularities became apparent. He could see chaos stalking closer. Someone grabbed Cillian and tried to pull him away. You can't be here. I'm not leaving. You need treatment. He's my father. I'm not leaving. Through the tangle of drug lines, he saw his father's eyelids flutter as he recognised Cillian's voice. Dad! With immense effort, Paul dragged his eyes open. A doctor saw the connection flicker between them. It's okay. The doctor nodded to Cillian. You can stay. He pointed to a spot near the head of the gurney. Talk to him. Don't let him... Um, just try to keep him here. Cillian crouched next to his father and gently put his hands on his forehead. I'm staying with you. But when he glanced up, Cillian saw the silent language passing between the medics, the hesitations and anxious blinks. He looked down at his father and saw his lips twisting as if he was fighting to say something. It's all right, try to stay calm. But his father seemed determined to get the words out and his mouth battled against the drugs that were flooding his body. Gilgamesh. It was hardly audible, more of a gasp than a word. Cillian didn't understand. The opiates must be scrambling his father's mind. Don't worry, I'm here, he whispered, powerless to help. But his father wasn't going to give up. Somehow he mustered the energy to feebly shake his head. Gilgamesh, he repeated, his eyes locked on his son, urging him to listen. Has he got biospheres insurance? The doctor's voice 
cut through the moment. Cillian glanced up. Is he insured? The doctor insisted. His vital organs have hemorrhaged. He needs replacements. Urgently. Cillian shook his head. They had nowhere near enough money for biospheres. He looked back to his father and saw him staring with such intensity, unable to muster the strength to say what he needed to say. Cillian bent so low that their heads touched and he could feel his father's fragile breath on his face. I don't understand. Gil. Gil. Suddenly, Paul drew a deep breath. As he sucked in the air, his throat gurgled. The data on the screens lurched, then started freewheeling. The monitoring beeps raced chaotically, fighting to keep up. Don't go, Cillian pleaded. Don't. Paul's eyes slid shut and he exhaled in a long sigh. Cillian waited for his father to draw breath again, waited for the next beat of his heart. But it never came. The medical team drew back from the table. Cillian watched the life drain from his father, saw pale blue tinge the pinkness of his lips. And it was over. A fist of pain thumped Cillian's chest. Somewhere in the background, he heard the doctor quietly say, Time of death, 10.34. Notify the digital executor. Executor. Cillian remained absolutely still, his hands clasping his father's cooling face. Chapter 6 The catastrophic violence of the bomb had scrambled Tessa's mind. She felt numb. All she wanted was to get away from the harrowing images flooding every wall screen and the electronic blue billboard across the city. She had to hide until she could get her head straight. But where? The agreed rendezvous? Too dangerous. The destruction would have blown all Blackwood's meticulous planning to pieces. Everything was different now, and for all Tess knew, Revelation had already been compromised which meant she might be walking straight into a trap. Where to go? Where? She looked out across the city, desperately hunting for ideas, and saw the ring of cranes on the horizon. Maybe on Foundation's churn churning margins, there was still hope. The shambolic rolling estates couldn't have felt more different to downtown. The noise and dust and confusion out there always left Tess reeling. Everything was temporary. Pop-up shops and cafes sprouted and evaporated on a daily basis. Buildings vanished and piling machines mechanically, sorry, ma magically appeared overnight and all life here seemed transient and improvised. A groaning crack echoed off the buildings as another huge slab of concrete crumpled into the street and kicked up a cloud of dust. Wherever Tess looked, cranes were tearing down old residential blocks, giant mechanical moles with boring gullies and bright hoardings announced new metro lines and apartment complexes. The noise and disruption was why it was so cheap to live out here and why it drew so many young people trying to get a toehold in the city. Rents were low because there was no security. Landlords squeezed the last few weeks out of places before the bulldozers moved in as yesterday's slums became tomorrow's foundation city. But while the half-complete infrastructure made life a gritty ordeal, it also meant it was little easier to stay off-grid. Saccharin opened the door and stared at her in shock. You can't be here. I've nowhere else to go. Are you crazy? He tried to shut the door, but Tess jammed it open with a foot. Don't turn me away. Please. He saw the anguish and confusion in her eyes. Shit. Reluctantly, Saccharin pulled her aside, checked no one had seen and threw the bolts across. I didn't change the plan, Tess said. 
Well, something went wrong. I swear, every last detail was checked. What difference does it make now? He glared at her angrily. I just need somewhere to think. Tess walked down the hallway and entered the tiny lounge. The laptop was open on the table, playing live images from the metro tunnel. Rescue workers were cutting through the tangled wreckage and carrying out body bags. How many dead? she whispered. Saccharin flipped the computer shut. No point torturing yourself. You were doing your duty. How could that be duty? she said bitterly. Following the faith means that you ju just that, doesn't it? Saccharin lit up a smoke anxiously. Following, not questioning. While we breathe, we trust, Tess said in a hollow voice. Right. While we breathe, we trust, Saccharin inhaled deeply. Tess could hear the doubt in his voice. Could I use the hole until it's safe again? I guess. Saccharin stubbed out his smoke, then pushed the battered sofa aside, lifted a bare a threadbare rug and removed four sections of floorboard to reveal a steel trapdoor. Don't worry, I've cleaned it since you were last here. He gave a grim smile and swung the door open. Carefully, Tess clambered down the narrow steps into the darkness and dropped onto a mattress. The torch is by your foot. Tess felt around until she found it and snapped the bulb on. You'd better have these as well. Saccharin rummaged in his pocket and pulled out a small tin. He flipped the lid to reveal two red capsules. What are they? You need to sleep. Tess shook her head. I need to find out what went wrong. You'll go crazy in the hole if you don't sleep. You know that. Just swallow them. Tess looked at the capsules. Pray, then sleep. I'll try to make contact with Revelation. He wasn't going to take no for an answer, so reluctantly Tess did as she was told. Then Saccharin closed the steel trap door and locked it. Tess heard the sofa being dragged back into position above her and wondered how long she was going to be down here. She looked around the tiny cell. No windows, no furniture, just the torch, the mattress, and a small grill that let fresh air in through a pipe in the wall. Nothing had changed since the stem cell engineer had been held here until his ransom was paid, except that Tess had been on the other side of the trapdoor then, guarding him, making sure he was fed and washed. Now she was in the hole. Even so, for the first time since the explosion, Tess felt safe. Maybe if she never left the hole, she'd never have to face what she'd done. But in the darkness, she could feel the rhythmic thump, thump of the pile drivers outside. Soon, this building would be consumed as well. She couldn't stay hidden forever. Slowly, her limbs started to feel heavy as the sedatives kicked in. Tess curled up and closed her eyes. Okay, that's it for today. Mr. Cliff will be reading the next extract tomorrow. Thank you for listening. Bye.